And if you will, please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. If you're visiting with us today, you should know that we've been in this chapter now for several weeks doing a series on the Beatitudes. And today we will look at the sixth Beatitude uh, together. As we have seen so far, the Beatitudes are spiritually wrought attitudes that ought to be in every born-again believer. I want you to hear those emphasis one more time. The Beatitudes are spiritually wrought, a work of God, an attitude that ought to be in every born-again believer. Oftentimes, we want to jump to what should we do? Preacher, what do we need to do about this? What do we need to do about that? When in reality, we must begin with being before doing. You need to be it before you do it. Amen. And so there's uh, six beatitude that we're looking at in Matthew 5, verse 8. It's no different. It, too, is a spiritually wrought work of God in the life of the individual that is described in this verse. So let's read it together. Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to ask you a couple of questions as we begin. What do you think of when you hear the word precious? What comes to your mind? How would you define it? One dictionary defines the word precious as beloved, dear, cherished, very costly or valuable, held in high esteem, especially in moral or spiritual matters. And that is exactly how I would describe the purity that is mentioned in the verse before you this morning. It is precious purity. And we will see later in the message that it's precious for a couple of reasons. But suffice to say for now, everything about this verse that we just read leaves you with your jaw on the ground in amazement as you seek to grasp everything that is being said here. You can't help but to stand in awe at what is promised in this verse. Can you just ponder for a moment this fact? They shall see God. And then beyond that, you can't help but to stand in awe at what is required in this verse in order to be able to see God, and that is that you must be pure in heart. Well, who among us this morning feels adequate to see God if the qualification to see God is to be pure in heart? And we will look at how that is possible in this message as well. But you might be wondering at this point, for those of you who have been a part of all of these messages on the Beatitudes, why didn't Jesus begin here? Isn't this the ultimate goal that we see God, to, that we would be pure in heart and that we would see God? Why wasn't this in verse 3 as the very first Beatitude? Well, let's look at where we've been and where we are so that we can understand why Jesus places this where he does. Because we've already seen that these are not just sporadically thrown out there, that there is intention, that there is a significance in the order in which these are given. Remember the first three Beatitudes and what they did. They point out our need and our response to that need. Look at verse 3. Jesus begins with, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Speaking about our spiritual poverty, our spiritual bankruptness. And then, in the very next verse, those who mourn. Our response to our need. We see the deficit. We see that there is this desperate hopelessness in and of ourselves outside of Christ, the spiritual bankruptcy, we mourn over our sin and our sinful state 
And then verse 3, from that we are made gentle. We are made meek. We are like the high-spirited horse who is broken under its new master. And so then in verse 6, the Lord turns our attention off of ourselves and looking at our own spiritual bankruptcy and mourning over that and being made gentle and meek by that to looking towards God's satisfying provision for our need. In other words, there is an answer to what we need. And as we hunger and thirst for that righteousness, we look beyond ourselves, we look outside of ourselves, we look to the Lord, hungering and thirsting for His righteousness. And from there on, we are looking at the result of that satisfaction. He says in verse 6 that they shall be satisfied. What does that satisfaction look like? How is it lived out? Well, in verse 7, he tells us one result of being satisfied is that we will be a merciful people. We as sinners saved by grace understand what it is to be lost, what it is to understand our depravity, our wickedness, our hopelessness. And all of that as a sinner, as an enemy of God, and that makes us merciful to other sinners who need the same saving grace as we do. And then today, we're looking at another result of that satisfaction, that we will be pure in heart. And then thirdly, we will see next week, Lord willing, that blessed are the peacemakers, that we are also made peacemakers. And then the Beatitudes end with the outcome of all of that. We saw our need, we mourned over our need, we were made meek by our need, we then hunger, thirst for righteousness, the Lord satisfies us, we are merciful, we are pure in heart, we are peacemakers. How then now does the world respond to such an individual? Jesus says those who are righteous, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers, will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Well, we'll get to that later. Today, I want you to see as we look at this precious purity, four things. Number one, I want you to see the priority of the heart. Society places a great emphasis on the human heart. You don't have to look very far at all to see commercials that are promoting medications and exercise equipment, diets, and much more as they try to promote a healthy heart. Restaurants, as you go in and open the menu, have even placed little heart-shaped logos next to the meal options that promote a healthy heart. In short, the human heart is a priority, and rightly so, because it's vital to life. You can live without fingers, you can live without hands, you can live without a lot of things, but you can't live without a healthy heart. It's no different, spiritually speaking. Our spiritual heart is priority because your spiritual heart is the real you. The heart, your heart, spiritually speaking, is the center of your being and the source of all that you do. All that you do, all that you think, all that you do, all that you say is an outflow from your heart. Your heart is the total man. It's the total you. It's your mind, will, and emotions. And its condition, the condition of your spiritual heart, is vital to your spiritual eternal life. If you have a bad heart, spiritually speaking, then your eternity, your eternal life is very bleak. But if you have a healthy heart, a pure heart, 
a godly heart, then there is the eternal life that is guaranteed by God in his presence. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs, the issues of life. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so again, your heart is the total you. It is the real you. And much like the physical heart, how you look on the outside does not necessarily tell the truth of what the condition of your heart is truly like. Many people, you have known people, I have known people who seemed healthy on the outside. They seemed to be okay by their outward appearance only to die of a massive heart attack unexpectedly. To get a phone call that they're in the ER and that they have to have emergency heart surgery, open heart surgery, stents put in and and a variety of things and and that's why so many doctors push getting a checkup because you can't just look in the mirror and know whether or not you've got a bad heart you need to get a checkup well consider me this morning the doctor who is urging you to get a spiritual examination of your heart Not to look in the mirror, not to compare yourself to the person next to you, in front of you, or behind you, but to go to the heart doctor himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, and say, Lord, search me and know if there be any wicked way in me. Know my heart. Look at my heart before you. And so what is the condition of your heart? Is it pure? This is important because the heart is where God looks. The Lord told Samuel when Samuel went to anoint a king that man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. That is why we are told throughout Scripture that we are to ask God to clean our hearts, Psalm 51.10, that we are to worship God with a whole heart, Psalm 9.1, that we are to pray for God to examine, to prove, and to try our heart, Psalm 26, verse 2, because we desire that the meditations of our heart be acceptable to God, Psalm 19.14. And on and on the verse verses go that emphasize the heart of the individual. In fact, the central focus of the Sermon on the Mount, which we are in in Matthew chapter 5, is the heart. Jesus is after the hearts of his listeners. Now, this is the exact opposite of what the religious leaders of Jesus' day was after. They focused on the outward religious rules, but neglected the greatest command, which focused on the inward relationship of the person. This is why they would swallow a camel and 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 gag at a gnat. This is this is why they focused on the outside of the cup while the inside of the cup was still filthy. They would get down to you can't walk but this far on the Sabbath. You can't do this, you can't do that. You can only go here, you can only say they worked on everything on the outside, but they neglected the greatest commandment which begins on the inside and works its way out and that is Love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Love God. Look at one chapter over. You can see Jesus 
dealing with this, and I wish we had time to, to, to spend here, but we don't. But I just want you to just, just glance and let your eyes scan with me. Look at verses 1 and 2. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So if your focus is on the outside and not the inside, you have your reward and it's not with God. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet. Don't do as the hypocrites do and the sound in the streets and all of this. For he says at the end of verse 2, for they have their reward in full. Then look down in verse 5. When you pray, you are to not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men and heard by men. Truly I say to you, what? They have their full reward. Look at verse 16. Again, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as, as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so they will be noticed by men. What does he say? Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. They're religious, but they're not right with God. Look at verses 19 through 21. Do not store for yourselves treasures, treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Look at this now. For where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. If your heart is with the approval of men, your treasure will be on earth. You will pray, you will fast, you will give to be seen by men. You will accumulate possessions to impress men. You will do everything that you do to impress the world, and you have your reward whenever you get the applause of the world. But if you are to have a relationship with God, then we are to store up things in heaven where God is. And this is a focus on the inside. And so in short, the primary target of the gospel is not outward obedience. It's not a rule, a bunch of rules of do's and don'ts. That's not the target of the gospel. The target of the gospel is the heart because the heart is priority. Number two. You know what? I just can't move on. This may have to turn into two messages. I don't know. But I have to give you one other area of concern before we move on. Just, listen to me, just as Christianity is not primarily about external behavior, your hand, what you do, do you go to church enough, do you read your Bible enough, do you pray enough, do you give enough, do you cuss, do you not cuss, do you get drunk, do you not get drunk, that just as Christianity is not primarily, listen to me, primarily about that, you don't Go down a checklist, and if you get a hundred on the checklist, you're a Christian. That's not how it works. But in the same way, Christianity is not merely about what we know and understand intellectually. It's not about the head either. Just like it's not about the hands, what we do, it's not primarily about the head, what we know. Now listen to me. Because we're not in a certain denomination this morning where work salvation is preached, many of us think that we're okay. Because we're not in a church that's preaching you've got to live good enough to be saved, focusing on the hands, focusing on the doing, focusing on the works, many of us think that we're okay when in reality many in the church are not okay because they have it in the head but not in the heart. They can tell you the Bible stories. They can tell you the gospel. They can tell you how to be saved. They can, take you, they can take you down the Roman road. They can do all of those things. They have all of the head knowledge. And if you ask them, are you going to heaven when you die? They say, absolutely, I believe in Jesus. But James says the devil believes and trembles. The devil believes, but he, he isn't going to heaven. 
The devil has a head knowledge of all of the doctrines and the gospel and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and all of these things, but he's not saved. What I want you to get before we move any further is that salvation involves the whole man, not a portion of the man. Hands is only a portion of the man. The head is only a portion of the man. Salvation involves the whole man. Of course we've got to hear the gospel. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where do you hear? You hear in the ear, in the mind, and the mind processes what you hear. So we hear and we understand I'm a sinner. We hear, we understand Christ came to die for sinners. We hear, we understand if I repent and be- of my sin and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, then I'm saved so it begins with the head you've got to understand it you've got to hear it you've got to grasp the gospel you've got to comprehend what the good news is but the danger is when we stop there somebody has said that you miss heaven by 18 inches that supposedly is somewhat of 18 inches from the mind to the heart You can't stop there. Salvation involves the mind, but it also must affect the heart. It must change the heart. And when it changes the heart, it affects how we think. It affects what we do. And all of those things that I said about the hands, about being in the Word of God, about praying, about giving, about being merciful, about uh, not being a drunkard, about not being a whoremonger, about not being a lot of things, and about doing a lot of things is a result of a changed heart. Does that make sense? If all you do is focus on the do's and don'ts, the hands, and neglect the heart, you're lost. If all you do is have the head knowledge of what the gospel is and what the answers are to the right questions, and you doesn't affect the heart, then we're in trouble. You're lost. Salvation is a head, heart, and hands And that is an unbreakable order of salvation. Which brings me to the second point, and that is the problem of the heart. Scripture also gives us insight as to why the emphasis is on the heart so much. It's because it is the source of all of our problems. This is why what I just preached won't work. If all you have is the right answers, you're still going to have a heart problem, and from that bad heart comes all of these evil things. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verses 15 through 20. Listen to what Jesus said, verse 16. Are you still lacking in understanding, Jesus asked? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? So it's not what goes in the man that defiles the man. Uh, That's why we've we've talked before and somebody says, well, you know, alcohol is evil. Well, alcohol is no more evil than a car is evil. But just like you can commit capital murder with a car, you can commit sinful acts with alcohol. You you see what I'm saying? And so what he says right here is, do you not understand (coughs) that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But here's the point. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. You see that? For out of the heart come what? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Jesus said, we don't have to focus on the outside. That's not what defiles the man. It's a heart problem. There's a heart problem here. 
And that's where the desire and pursuit of drunkenness comes. That's where all of these other sinful desires comes from. And that's why it's been well said that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 5, Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Listen, man's problem is not his surroundings. It's not his environment. That's what the world says. The world says that if we could just get them out of the ghetto. If we could just get them with father figures, if we can just get these people out of these scenarios and into a better environment, then that would change them. No, it wouldn't. It's not an environment problem. It's a heart problem. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Do you see the problem? If not, let me give it to you from an, another angle. In Revelation 21, 27, this is what the Bible says. Nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. Talking about heaven. Talking about eternity with God. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing unclean will be in heaven. Nothing that practices lawlessness and abomination will be in heaven. Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. For outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. What is the problem of the heart? The problem of the heart is that the heart is sinful, it is wicked, and there is nothing that will be sinful and that is wicked that will be in heaven who will spend eternity with God. Nothing. And that's why it's so important that we get to number three, the purity of the heart. If this is our heart by nature, how can we ever qualify to see God if it's only the pure in heart that will see God? And what does that even mean? What's Jesus saying? What does being pure in heart mean? It carries the idea, listen to me now, of single-mindedness, unmixed, and without hypocrisy. It means that the heart is cleansed from all filth, it is without defilement, and it is no longer divided. Remember what Jesus said? No man can serve what? Two masters. You can't have a divided heart. Purity in heart is the inward purity of one's motives that fleshes itself out in one's actions. This word was also used in biblical times to speak of metal, when metal was purified, when it was put in the fire, and all the impurities were, were brought to the surface, and the dross was taken off, and the impurities were brought out as it was going through the fire. That's what purity of heart means. So often, our problem is a divided heart, isn't it? It's a heart that kind of wants to live for God, but kind of wants to be successful in business too. It's, it's a heart that, that, that kind of wants to live for God over here a little bit, but wants all of these other things and prioritizes it above and beyond God as well. And it's a divided heart. Purity in heart is undivided, unmixed, without hypocrisy. To further define a pure heart, it's a heart of unfeigned obedience. It is to think, speak, and act, as I've said, without hypocrisy. It's to have your heart in tune and in step with God's heart. 
It's to have our outward acts of holiness to be in harmony with our inward purity of heart. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. Let me summarize it this way. To be pure in heart is to involve nothing less than your whole person. Remember head, heart, hand? It's all involved and it's all affected. And so if we are to see God, there must be an unmixed pure holiness and purity about our being. How we think, the character, the character and integrity of our every being, and how we outwardly live our lives is all affected. Do you know what the parallel passage to this text is? It's found in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. And do you know what the Bible says in that verse? Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, what is the promise in our verse? That the pure in heart shall see God. The tales of that coin is that without holiness, which is synonymous with purity in heart, without that purity, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And so all of this is just to say that the heart is the root and everything else is the fruit. And so if you have a rotten heart, then you have a rotten life in the eyes of God. You say, well, wait a minute, my life's not rotten. I'm a good person. I'm a great grandmother. I'm a great grandfather. I'm a great parent. You don't know what I do. I'm in the trenches. I am a good person. But all our righteousness in the sight of God upside his holiness is what? Filthy rags. And there's none that does good, no, not one. And there's none that seeks after God. And on and on he goes in Romans chapter 3. And so that is the condition of our heart. And what God requires is purity. Well, that leads us to a very important question. How then can we have a pure heart? We can't cleanse our own hearts. We can't accomplish this holiness and purity on our own. Many men have tried. It may work for a short season, but we utterly fail and fall short of the glory of God. The answer is twofold, and they're both sovereign acts of God. They are both a pairing of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. God initiates, God does a work, God gives the grace to accomplish it, and we respond in obedience, and we walk faithfully, and God gives grace, and on and on the process goes. Here is the twofold answer. Are you ready? Number one, positional, and number two, progressive. Positional and progressive. Purity in heart begins with position. It is a moment in time when God convicts you and draws you and shows you your need of salvation and everything that we've preached. And in that moment, when you repent and when you believe, God changes your position. You are washed in the blood of Jesus. You are forgiven of your sins. Your past is cleansed as far as the east is from the west. Buried in the sea of God's forgetfulness is all of your sins and transgressions against God. Everything that was against God about you is forgiven. And God takes you from a child of hell, a child of darkness, a child of eternal damnation under his wrath, and he makes you a child of heaven. He positionally places you as his son, his daughter in Christ. And that's never altered. It can't be. God does the work. 
you respond in repentance and in faith and God changes the position. But it doesn't stop there. Because we've got to do something with all of these verses that talk about those who fall away are damned and those who don't make it. And those, Is that teaching work salvation? No. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. We just said God does the position changing. God does the saving. From there, it's progressive. What do I mean by progressive? Sanctification. Positional justification. God justifies you just as if you never sinned, just as if you always obeyed. God gives you the righteousness of Christ. He washes you in the blood. You are justified. Now God is going to work and sanctify you. And this prog progressive sanctification, here's how it works. God made you pure of heart, but you still live in a sinful body, don't you? I know I do. And that old man still tries to raise his ugly head. And he still likes to say things he shouldn't say and think things he shouldn't think. And so God, who began a good work in you positionally, will work, will progressively bring you along. And he has given the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so now as you pray, now as you get into the Word of God, now as you faithfully come to the worship of God and place yourself under the means of God's grace, now as you faithfully come to the Lord's table and the Lord's supper and commune with him, now as you come into the congregation of the saints of God and you are you are are faithfully being a part of the one another's God is giving grace and God is molding you and God is shaping you and God is conforming you into the image of Christ in short God is purifying your heart you see does that make sense and that's how all of that works together in the Bible. Yes, salvation is repent and believe, but it's not a one-time act. The position is, but you know what? I was saved when I was 15 years old. I'll be 40 in April, and I'm still repenting and believing. It's not something I did that, done that, got the T-shirt, let me pick up where I left off. God, at that moment, at 15 years old, he changed me. And I haven't been able to get over it yet. And every time I thought I did find something that got me over it, that was more exciting and more satisfying, God knocked me on my back to get me to look up and brought me back to the fold again because God chastens those he loves. And those who are without chastening are bastards and not sons. And that's not me using harsh language. That's what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. Why? Because those he positionally changes must by necessity be a part of the progressive sanctification. And if God is not doing a work in you, it's because he never did a work in you. You, you see what I'm saying? Doesn't matter how you can go back to a date, a time, a prayer prayed, a water baptismal, tingly feelings going down your back. That may have been bad pizza from the night before. That's not what does it. <laughs> there have even been great men of God who have been pastors for 50 plus years who say, let me tell you how I know I'm saved because I'm still trusting and believing and repenting every day. I don't go back to an experience when I was 8 years old or 18 years old or 80 years old. I look to the fact that God has affected a change in my heart. And that change in my heart has affected my mind. It has affected my emotions. It has affected my will. And now I will to live for God. I will to get up and rise up and be a godly husband and a godly father. And I, I strive for that by the grace of God. And he's still working on me in those things. But it's a, pro a, a process. It's a progressive work that God must do in us. That's the purity of heart. Let me close with this. 
What is the precious privilege of a pure heart? Here it is. They shall see God. And we've been here quite a bit this morning, and I've mentioned this quite, quite a lot, and so I won't take any more of your time. But let me tell you what that means. I don't know what it means fully. I don't think anybody can explain it fully. But for one, in the here and now, there is a sense in which the child of God can see God in a way nobody else can. When you get saved, you see God in nature. You see God in the events of human history. You see His providential hand in the affairs of your life. You can actually see where God answered prayer. And you see the work of God. It's not something you see <coughs> like I see this pulpit in front of me, but you see <coughs> much like you see the wind. Have you ever seen the wind? No, you haven't. You've only seen the effects of the wind, the rattling of the leaves, the bending of the trees, and on and on it goes. Why? You see the effects. I see the hand of God everywhere. But one day, even though we look now through a glass darkly, there is coming a day we'll see him face to face. And that is what John meant when he said, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet appeared as what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Listen to this. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. You think there's any coincidence that that's paired together with us one day seeing God? Of course it's not. There's that responsibility paired with the work of God. Because we will one day see God, there is a purity in our heart and we're still purifying ourselves. We're still seeing things in our house, in our bodies that need to be cleaned up. It's, it's kind of like living for a while with the lights kind of dim in the house and, and you think you got everything cleaned up and straightened up and then finally you put new bulbs in the fixtures and there's more light in the house and now you see the crack in the ceiling. And now you see the stains on the walls, and there's more work that needs to be done. Why? Because there's more light. And the more light of God that gets in us through His Word, through His Spirit, the more God works, and the more we see God for who He is, the more we see we need to put it off and put on and get rid of this and clean out that and, and do this. And, and all of this is God's work as we're purifying ourselves as He is pure. This morning as we have a song of response in just a, in just a moment, I want to I speak to those of you who are saved and, and then I want to speak to those who are lost very quickly. I want to encourage all of us as believers to set our affections on things above where Christ is and to do so with an undivided heart that we would yield to the Holy Spirit's work in us and pray, pray that we would be captivated by God's wonder, by God's excellencies and God's glory. And here's why I say that. Here's why I say that. One day you're going to see God. And I don't think that grips us like it should. If we, if we truly grasp that, it would change everything about us. If you knew today, today, at 9 p.m. tonight, you seen that commercial where the, where the girl gets the little note that says your heart attack will happen today? And it's a little commercial saying that you don't get notifications about heart attacks. Well, you don't get notifications about when God's going to take you home. But let's just say, hypothetically, you got one. How would that change how you spent this afternoon? How would that change the priority of your life? Brothers and sisters, we're going to see God. We're going to see Him. 
And in a sense of respect, that ought to be a fearful thing. Fearful as in awe. But not fearful that we should shrink back in shame. But will that be, a, be the case? It will be if you squander and waste your life. Let us be diligent in preparing to see the king. The regal doors of heaven will one day open for us and we will have access to the king of kings and the Lord of lords and we will stand. Better said, we will fall on our faces in his presence. What a glorious, glorious promise. And this morning, if you're not saved, the word of God is clear as to how you may be one who has a pure heart. God must cleanse it. God must change it. And here's the good news. God's promised to do so if you will repent and believe. If you will draw nigh to God, God has promised to draw nigh to you. And so the question is, will you be saved? Will you be washed in the blood? Will you be born again so that you'll be ready to see God? Let's pray.